वॉम वेलकम टू एवरीबडी आई एम श्रीजा अग्रवाल एंड यू आर वॉचिंग द लाइव मे स्पेशल सीरीज ऑन फ्यूचर ऑफ पेमेंट्स एट अ टाइम वेन देर सो मच अनसर्टेनिटी इन द एनवायरमेंट एट अ टाइम वेन बिजनेस लीडर्स एंड सी ओज आर ग्रैपलिंग एंड ट्राइंग टू सीक आंसर्स द क्वेश्चन दैट वेर एग्जैक्टली इज द नेक्स्ट नॉर्मल और द न्यू नॉर्मल perhaps the conversation now needs to shift from finding the next normal and trying to understand that how do you really become anti fragile when you become anti fragile what really you are talking about is to how do you grow through change and challenge anti fragility is of course of two levels one at the organizational level and the other at the sectoral level today we talk to you about a sector which has seen relentless or explosive growth in the last two or three years of course we're talking about the payments industry which really has grown on the back of huge capital influx on the back of huge internet penetration on the back of huge e-commerce boom and the growth of this sector has been very well chronicled but the question now is that will the pandemic really test the resilience of this space today in our first installment of the series future of payments we talk to very well distinguished experts trying to really understand how they are thinking about building anti fragility in the organization and also building organization that last for law which includes thinking about innovation mental models and really ensuring customer growth which really is at the heart or the most important stakeholder in any conversation and what is better than doing it with people who do this as part of their daily jobs please help me welcome adit petkul karni at cash free to help you create pay your need gupta investment venture partners and sanjay swami prime ventures adit here i would like to begin with yeah thank you that uh, shrija uh, the way the company's dna is right cash free uh, to be frank right i i joined just uh, 11 months back cash free to i'm heading the business here and i am in fintech space for last 7 8 years so i am keep observing how the different uh, competitions or the different companies are evolving in terms of the product and processes and when i see cash free right uh, if you see the evolution also the eventually the first one was a bulk payout solution in 2015 instead of taking the regular route of a collection side the company went through the payout solution so even now that trend has continued where more of the uh solutions are merchant or the customer centric than more of a market driven or the competition driven so how we are working now also is that what is the need of the hour for example even the rbi vision document talks about it how do you give the better user experience or the customer experience so cashree is working on providing those particular aspect one is how the payment should be seamless how the refund should be processed and the how reconciliation should be done so these are the new benchmarks we are setting in the industry and we are now defining the norm for it right rather following the trend which is out come to you now you know uh, we heard from uh, aditya i'll come to you come come to you now you have seen the various cycles of fintech entrepreneurship you know you've been a seasoned investor you invest in the likes of motilal oswal and things like that that was like first wave of financial services entrepreneurship now we have this rise and advent of digital payment upstarts and fintechs you know when you have a situation like a pandemic which is an unprecedented hard time what is your advice to fintechs how are you ensuring the key metrics what is your communication with them what are the kind of conversations that you're having with your entrepreneurs give us some color there so I'll, i'll i'll split it into two or three different parts rija one is um, fintechs is a sort of a very bastardized word uh, there are different ways in you think about that business so there are a bunch of people who are software businesses and there are a bunch of people who call themselves fintech but are basically lending businesses masquerading as technology businesses and third is what's happened with the covid ecosystem and both businesses have i would say tailwinds and headwinds uh, from from this covid 19 impact so if, so let me cover the first one which is the lending business on the on the financial technology side i think the fintech ecosystem of technology lending is basically uh you know sort of a more a better operationally run bank that's what it essentially is they are taking risk on their balance sheet sometimes in partnership with other banks but basically it's a lending business and lending businesses are not necessarily tech businesses if you are building your own balance sheet at the end of the day 
you are driven by how much NPA your portfolio would look like, how much liquidity you can have, both from equity and debt perspective. And and it's not even COVID. I would say relative post last nine to twelve months, liquidity side has been massively challenging for the lending fintech side of the ecosystem. And I think that will continue to be challenging. And their portfolios probably have been hit the most. And the liquidity to them, they probably are the last bucket that large banks and NBFC would look at from uh, giving uh, large allocations in terms of debt. Even housing finance companies today, which have secured assets, long-term nature, essentially are facing liquidity problems. So I don't know if you saw the HTFC result. It's gone. Uh, the total... Uh, um, provisioning on COVID has gone up 5x than a normal provisioning that they do every quarter. Sure. I, I'm pretty sure that on the personal loan and credit card side, that number, I, I don't even know what that number is going to look like. A lot of businesses on the lending side are going to face a tougher challenge on the fintech side. A lot of them will not survive. On the software businesses, I think the software businesses inherently have a very significant advantage. Uh, just by the fact that the gross margins of this business are particularly very interesting. Secondly, I think they've been hit by the pandemic deliberately because they are derivative businesses on top of offline on online merchants and use cases thereof. And those, those have had challenges um, where due to shutdowns, the volumes have gone down dramatically. I think the tailwind for those businesses is the fact that cash and delivery as a concept in the consumer internet ecosystem side is going to disappear and continue to disappear from both from a customer perspective and merchant perspective. That's one. Second, I think the, the demon was the first digitization throughput that happened and you had ATM and a bunch of other companies come up. And but basically the whole UPI ecosystem and 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 Sanjay probably knows this better. He's been involved in a bunch of that. Mm -hmm. They have basically appended the monetization model of these businesses. The challenge there is not adoption from a customer perspective or merchant perspective. Post COVID, you will have a lot of tailwind on adoption, uh, whether it's pay later, whether it's payout, whether it's from Excel sheet, seven people in finance getting together and trying to do this, like what Cashly does to digitization, integration with merchants, backend, frontend, lots of stuff, lots of tailwind, short term, lots of headwinds given that the volumes have dried up, but that's like nine to 18 months. It's anybody's guess what it looks like, but when it's back, there will continue to be a lot of tailwind for this business. The challenge is monetization because the UPI does not allow anybody to effectively monetize. And on online payment ecosystem, when you are uh, basically, the businesses again are trending towards lending as marketplaces. So I have the flow. Let me start a lending business on top of that. That seems attractive because the less than 2000 rupee on the debit card and, and on the UPI side, which is the fastest growing segment, really does not have a monetization angle. So I think a bunch of businesses would get built out on the software side. I think the challenge that they will continue to face is monetization. But I'm far more bullish on the software platforms. Given the tailwind on adoption, I have to find a monetization model which is very credible in the long run, not based on lending again. That's how I would see it. So I get to you now, Sanjay. I think Vishal kind of laid out the opportunity and the challenges set for us. And it was very, very clear and candid. And I must say, like, extremely out there that, you know, he is not such a big fan of lending businesses, so to speak. I think he will put his bet on software. I would like to understand from you and talking specifically about the payments piece in the entire larger fintech, uh, you know, conundrum, so to speak. How will the monetization models evolve there? You know, can you sort of give us some sense and color there, Sanjay? Sure. So um, uh, just quick background for uh, for others, uh, the listeners as well. So I'm an early stage uh, probably India's first, you know, uh, mobile payments entrepreneur from my MCheck days, and then worked with Nandan and the Aadhaar team uh, as a volunteer for some time, and then have been quite actively involved both as a volunteer on uh, iSpread India stack as well as uh, as a, as a as a venture capitalist investing in a variety of companies, right? Uh, and I think uh, as a VC, our philosophy has always been that uh, eventually there will be no money in moving money around. Right, so uh, it it was something that uh, we always believed was coming. Uh, so whether it was a company like Easy Tap in the payment acceptance space, or Happy in the business payments uh, space, 
uh, Neo and digital banking, you know, Reco and transaction reconciliation, all the companies that we have uh, looked at, we have always looked at it and I completely agree with what Vishal said. Uh, the value will be in software around digital payments, right? So the one thing that, uh, and uh, companies like Cashpre and the others have also done very well, and as well as uh, generally others in the ecosystem, uh, is with the advent of UPI, we have a real time, really low cost uh, from a cost perspective and zero uh, price from an MRP perspective. Payments rails that is one of a kind right now in the world uh, that allows real time interbank payments, right? It's not possible. Today, my close friend in the US had to send me back $70 for something that I had uh, paid for uh, him here in India. And we were struggling around how, how do we do this, right? In India, it would have been instantaneous. Right? So I think we have a very unique situation. And the second big thing that's happening is the uh, demonetization actually achieved something very big, right? It wasn't that, you know, uh, people in, in the demonetization, people move towards accepting digital payments as a as a way of payment but still probably preferred cash at the end of it right at, at the mass level today with covid and then the concerns around touching cash and stuff like that suddenly the digital payment has become the preferred mode as well right but the first phase was at least my milkman would say that's okay if you want to pay me through upi that's okay but i would prefer cash now he says i prefer uh, digital payment right so that has that has changed right that's the next big step function growth so when that happens, right, so earlier digital payments was 3% of the retail payments, right, and very small percentage of B2B, uh, because B2B was also completely doing checks, right, so the need to reconcile transactions, the need to have software processes, you know, it wasn't that significant, right, but now if you look at it from a utility bills perspective, right, and I'm sure uh, Cashfree and others are experiencing it, it's probably 80%, right? And and it's, in fact, it's probably even even more because everybody is paying through it, right? So that creates, it, it solves one problem. And yes, there is no monetization model for the actual payment processing. But the fact that it's such a core part of everybody's business means that they're going to need, uh, you know, analytics tools, you know, reconciliation tools, you know, other side, sort of tools around, uh, uh, you know, things like, you know, fraud management, you know, make sure that the collections are in you know, automated in several ways so that creates the opportunity for software players to build businesses that are solving the payments problem where the actual moving of the money is not going to be something people pay for right so that's where the focus is going to be and then if you overlay you know the the four big areas right if you have payments as the rails financial services is really about um, savings lending investment and insurance right with the exception of lending which which probably never has a product market fit problem right giving money never has a product market fit collecting is the challenge and so oh, lending will come back so there's no question about it lending. Both you and no no, no I'm, I'm not agile and in fact what i'm saying is lending is never going to be a problem right that business will absolutely come back it's a matter of time right uh, but the other three have taken off right so the because people are putting money in savings People suddenly have a lot more disposable income because nobody's eating out, nobody's traveling, nobody's buying any stuff. So they're putting money into investment. So you're going to see a lot of that boom happening. And people are buying insurance because now suddenly people have realized that, you know, I'm better off if I do insure myself, right? So I think as a investor in this sector, while there might be a short term sort of slowdown because it's just impractical to meet people and make investments easily, we are really excited about the opportunity here and we're very bullish about the number of new startups that are going to come and the opportunity for existing startups as well to scale up so it's a, it's going to be a very exciting time in india okay uh, i come to you now rohit we heard from the two vcs they also sort of heard from aditya uh, i think both of them are very clear on what pockets within the fintech space sort of seem interesting and appealing to them uh, perhaps you can give us a view from the other side you know what has really the pandemic event for you was an opportunity and i think the word which was uh, majorly used around was a rise of the contactless economy and what it truly mean for the payment space throw some light there for us yeah Sure. Uh, thanks. Thanks a ton for having me here and really great to hear some insights coming from Aditya Vishal and Sanjay. So for a quick 
quick uh, intro for the audience's sake. Uh, Pioneer is a global B2B platform which uh, you know helps cross-border sellers and customers get paid from their buyers. Uh, it's a very simplistic explanation of what we do. But largely what happens is today when you do an international transaction, uh, and typically you use banks for doing that, it's a pretty complicated uh, transaction. It goes through multiple corresponding banks and stuff like that. And that's why it's super difficult. Uh, today, if somebody has to get paid in the US dollar, then Sanjay is uh, testimony to it that he's finding it hard to get even $70 paid from his friend. Uh, I wish it was a commercial transaction. He could cut an invoice to his friend and I could give him a very slick platform where he could do it in seconds, if not uh, uh, faster than that, uh, if not real time. There's a pitch right? coming from Rohit's for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. So, 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 so uh, in short, what, what we do is really help these exporters or people yeah. who want to sell abroad, both in goods and in services. Coming back to your point on what does the pandemic actually mean and what has happened in the global sphere. This this uh, downturn, if I may call it so, I'm not sure that I should call it a downturn or no, but still is a little different than the previous one. If you look at 2008, 2009, uh, it was consumerism, which was really affected very bad. Uh, this time around, it is the inability of people to go back to work. And that's more on the supply side of workforce than anything else. So, so it's not that uh, people don't have money to buy things or they're not going to buy for a very long period of time. So, so to that extent, it's a little different than what, uh, what happened in the previous times. Uh, and we believe that uh, as soon as we are able to kind of, you know, uh, get uh, things back into action, people have a short memory, things will change, people will come back to traveling, people will come back to doing all the normal things. But uh, coherently, this, the, or, the, the certain things will change permanently. For example, we're doing this, this edition on a Zoom call. Uh, some of these things will become very normal. And what we saw was that in early Feb and uh, uh, if, say from early Feb to early March, uh, things on the supply chain side was disrupted very bad. And uh, we anticipated that uh, things are going to kind of, you know, crash down south. I remember the movie Gravity in which, you know, the, they have a free fall. And I thought we we're going through some stage like that where Sandra Bullock and, you know, uh, the team is really coming down. But uh, what happened is that our estimates were completely off, off the record, off target. Uh, Q1 was better than anywhere else, any, any other quarter for us. We beat our budget numbers. Uh, we work with the likes of Amazon and Walmart and some of the other marketplaces helping them uh, pay their suppliers and the sellers collect money from these marketplaces. And the reason is that uh, most of the markets except for India were uh, able to really come back very fast. And a lot of traders, manufacturers and suppliers, especially in China, were able to you know, uh, pivot into essential supplies and the numbers are staggering. I don't know if you read uh, yesterday's or day before yesterday's Walmart's uh, results that came out. They talked about 40% odd growth in, in this period. Uh, we ourselves saw double digit growth for all the e-commerce businesses globally. Uh, India has been a little different because of the lockdown. Sellers have not been able to send their goods out. So we did see a decline in India on the goods side. But uh, that's not true for other verticals. Uh, for example, the what we call as services vertical uh, and the freelancer vertical, which we also service, uh, volumes have held on. We thought freelancers will be out, out of business. They won't get paid. They'll be in really very hard conditions. They'll face very hard conditions, but that didn't occur. Uh, in fact, 74% freelancers said that they didn't, even, they didn't even drop price. We did a survey with them and we found out that they didn't even uh, let go of smaller teams that they had. Uh, so, so things for them are happening. Uh, what we realized is that uh, the losses that, that happened to us or the, the downturn that happened to us in certain sectors like travel, for example, Airbnb and Uber are some of our clients and they obviously, their revenues tanked big time, uh, but uh, others compensated. So overall, people who had a portfolio mix, people who had a good industry mix really did not get affected that bad. 
uh, but certain sectors, especially uh, you know the low end gig uh, gig workers, the migrant workers, those got hit very bad. So so there are like pockets of really badly affected people, but by by far we didn't see people really lose revenue or uh, you know mayhem spread across. So we're really very positive in the way we'll come out of it, and uh, we really hope that uh, things take a better shape as we go along. Sure, uh, Aditya. Uh, I'll sort of get back to sort of you now. We heard from uh, Rohit also, and he said that it has been a mixed bag for them. The business has not really been impacted so badly. Uh, I really want to understand, get onto this question of uh, innovation and the culture of innovation in the organization, because it is extremely important. And how do you make sure that uh, one is the innovation as a response to COVID? So is that a more permanent response? to a black swan event which tests the resilience of action how have you been thinking about making changes in the organization when these events happen or if they do not happen things really remain the same and you are extremely strong and you merge from the stronger so the sort of aditya you can give us some color there that you know how have you thought about innovation within the organization and as somebody who is leading business in the organization what is the mental model on how you have thought about this give us some color there sure thanks rija so uh, this was a black swan effect and i would say uh, in my short career of last 12 13 years uh, this happened twice right the one was demonetization the second was this covid and uh, i am in payments domain and uh, this impacted me in both professionally and personally and uh, right now when i look at it right so uh, some of us we spoke also right that the user behavior will it change permanently uh, our view is yes to some extent yes there will be tailwind effects for this but some of the behavior that is adopted in such a condition that duress may not last longer but yes if you keep keep nudging the user in the direction yes the behavior will continue and as a business said what i see is that uh, when this covid lockdown everything started uh, some of the industries got impacted severely in a negative way for example travel which just uh, fell off the cliff but at the same time a uh, gaming uh, education uh, edutech kind of sector right which really took the uh, uptick uh, uptick growth in that way so we can see that some of these trends will continue to grow we majorly adapted to those kind of learning for example um, as a professional also i just finished a coursera course right which i never did when i was i'm logged on i save 2 hours of my time every day what do i do i finished one fintech course so this will keep continuing in my view and uh, what how we are uh, we are considering it is yes uh, some of the points which vishal and sanjay mentioned right the moving money is a small part of it we have to look at the holistic picture right for example a gaming merchant say for example what is that they require as a payment solution rather than a payment product Uh, he needs collection he needs payouts he needs some sort of analytics he need a broad management system so our innovation is more on the holistic side of it it is not about opening the next door to find out oh i okay, i will build a small piece of software which will help rather than look at it can i cover the entire sector and give the solution and help them to one allow the merchant to uh, inline their financial supply chain for example if it is a hyper local merchant can i collect the money get the instant settlement and immediately give the money to the vendor so that way the disruption in supply chain will be lower the second one is the user part of it right how do we enhance now user has come to the platform now it will be a cardinal sin on my part if the transaction fails so what do i do to make sure the transaction is successful i have to improve my infrastructure because we are happy it's a good problem right everyone is making online payment that that puts a higher stress on infrastructure itself so i have to build a scalable systems i have to build the system which work 24/7 every time all the time and users should be able to move the transaction these are some of the thought processes that we have sure that i understand that but uh, how has your business been impacted like you know rohit laid out that you know it was a mixed bag while some pockets were going down some pockets were also going up so can you give me a sense of how has your business impacted it's like down by 25% up by 30% what can the sense can give us okay. that the first quarter maybe the q1 
So last four five weeks we are doing weekly reviews, right? And we are weekly growth is around ten percent. We have grown a week on week basis. The impact at the negative impact definitely NBFC and uh, travel got hit. But at the same time, we see seen a very good growth in gaming, edutech, insure tech segment, which we have seen a very good jump. So whatever we lost in some of the sectors, we have comfortably gained in other sector. We are performing better. Interesting, uh, Vishal. I come to you now. I think this is the second round of uh, questioning, and the first round, all of you sort of laid out the opportunity and the challenges set. Uh, and we spoke about the anti fragility bit and how we're thinking about this. I want to come to you now, Vishal. Sure understand from you that, you know, when you take a 360 degree view of the entire financial services landscape, and we also had a downturn, which was the economic downturn of the past. Right now, what we are seeing is a mix of humanitarian crisis plus an economic downturn. But how do you build an organization which lasts for so long that it is so resilient that it can take these shocks, you know, within itself? And you you mentioned some examples of some great companies that you have backed, you know, what maybe you have learned from them three or four key pieces of advice about innovation or mental models, or perhaps what you have contributed to them, and you can actually substantiate that with examples. It will be very meaningful to our watchers and listeners. So, so Shrija on 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 the startup ecosystem where I operate, rule number one: don't run out of cash. Please don't run out of cash. Okay, that's the single most operating rule for the startup ecosystem because a demand will happen, a pandemic will happen, which has affected a large swath of things. Something else will happen. If the, right now it's all about. people who have the ability to survive have the ability to essentially morph themselves and build better solutions and better products but please you know the single most important factor for our ecosystem is survivability and which essentially means that when they are burning cash i know aditya's organization is not burning cash right now but for most of the ecosystem they are and if they are then they essentially need to make sure that they survive that's rule number 1 i think the, the comment <laughs> <laughs> uh, so no i think the the key here is uh, uh uh basically you know so for example pre upi what sanjay mentioned uh there were people making a ton of money on on just moving the money around so uh, look at mastercard and visa globally 100 billion plus organizations uh, they have they have lots of things but they essentially do authentication and make a small a toll gate keeper sort of revenue on that i think in an indian context and i'm going to stick to india that does not exist because and a lot of people were making money of that essentially pre upi i think that but people who were actually building core solutions like what aditya mentioned is it's not about moving the money or you know i have a transaction that i can deliver for you but it's about the solution with the large enterprises and the small enterprises and i think the complexity and and i'll stick myself to the payment ecosystem the the complexity of this ecosystem is is i think sometimes we think it's trivial actually it's very very hard to do what these guys do what rohit sanjay and uh, rohit sanjay in his past and what aditya do is an exceptionally hard business at the back end from a 24 by 7 99.49 availability it's not easily done given all the challenges that exist in this country on infrastructure and, and everything else to be able to do that seamlessly and deliver solutions to large enterprises at a price and a cost which gets renegotiated every single in every monthly conversation is not an easy task so if you are able to actually build value for your customers that's what ensures survivability that's what ensures ability to survive and grow in the future so i would say it's delivering value to each one of the customers that you your stakeholders in the in the current ecosystem for example there are 17 or 18 different ways that you can pay digitally in india today probably only country where you have i know 30 wallets 17 bank apps and and whatever else and and a sodexo coupon laid on top of that and able to seamless and hundreds of 
transactions, uh, uh, intermittent lines that connect the banks, uh, legacy banking ecosystem, and being able to seamlessly do all of that recon uh, in, a, in an instantaneous manner uh, is, 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 a, is, is essentially a job that's not easy. But what has happened is that that's become a commodity now for a lot of people. And, and that commodity, therefore, has value to it, but it's a small value to it at the end of the day. So then you have to basically say, what else that I can do for my customer? Uh, is, is it about same day, same day payment acceptance? Can I lend against it? Because I already know that money is sitting in an escrow with the bank. Can I do a recon because of 100 different payment instruments across 3,000 stores? Um, uh, and how do I recon that into an ERP? How much is received from home? Uh, which bank owes me how much? Move that money to a current account, whether in an HDFC and ICICI, who's going to give me the best bank for the buck? Is he going to renegotiate my uh, you know, uh, payment gateway rates if there's a PG rate against that? And can I pass that on to my customer? All of that is a complicated ecosystem that people essentially need to work through. So I think value to the stakeholder is is very critical uh, during this period of time. The one thing that I disagree with Aditya and, and Rohit is, is I think uh, we are in for tough times. I think it's not a supply disruption. A lot, there have been massive job losses in the ecosystem and a lot of purchasing power is gonna go away. And And none of us are pandemic experts. We really don't know what, when, why, it's very hard to answer any of those questions. You know, and, and looking at rear view in the past is just very hard. And all the numbers that pop up every day on the screen actually have no real meaning at some level. What really, what really, I, we would all, we are all investors, we are looking to value businesses on what happens in the future, not what happened in the past. What's happened in the past is just a mirror to say, what potentially these businesses could deliver in the future at best. But given a black swan event like this, it's just very hard. So it's, it's essentially, I, I think if you have a business which is, which is essentially just going to be retail focused in the long run, we don't even know when retail comes back. We don't know how many, how many people will walk into a, I, for, for example, I don't think I'm going to walk into a mall for the next 12 months. No chance irrespective of where pandemic, no pandemic, it's just going to be very hard. So I'm not swiping my credit card, debit card, whatever I have, I'm not going to swipe it. And I think there's a large percentage of people who have the ability, essentially the second category is not just going to walk into any of the crowded ecosystems. And that, that means a lot of things will shift online. And what can you deliver online for these companies? The challenge with online in India is each ecosystem is an oligopoly uh, or a duopoly at best. And in oligopolies and duopolies, they don't let you make money as a vendor. It's very hard. It's not no straightforward. Uh, so why would Swiggy want to pay cash free for all the payouts if it can hire 100 engineers and build out the whole ecosystem itself? Yes, I will pay it because I don't have a solution today and I learn from cash free, but I'll build it on my own. The challenge is, is the e-commerce ecosystem. So is, a, is everybody like a lifestyle to everybody will have like a, online cart ecosystem with logistics as a platform, payment as a platform, and everybody else as a platform, that becomes interesting. Because if I'm dependent on Flipkart and Amazon, I definitely ain't making any money. Uh, in short run, you may, but in the long run, definitely not. So I think it's, it's not an easy situation to be in, uh, at least uh, you know, generally from a business structuring perspective. And therefore, if you can build value for that, not for Amazon and Swiggy and the Flipkarts of the world, but for the next layer, which is the large SMB, 100 store, 30 store, 20 store, or the offline ecosystem, because they do not have the ability to do this uh, uh, contactless payments to recon to everything else, to ERP integration, to lending layer on top of that, that becomes very interesting. But I, I'm not so sure that the online ecosystem with the oligopolies is an ecosystem where you will make money in the long run.
Interesting. I think uh, thanks, uh, Vishal, for giving such a candid and having such tough questions laid out for the entrepreneurs out there. Of course, it's not going to be easy. I would love to hear if Aditya and Rohit had a counter view on this, but I will get back to Sanjay now. Uh, Sanjay, I think uh, Vishal was kind of pretty clear and candid as to where he sees opportunities set, and he said that retail is perhaps not necessarily the way to go forward if i were to do a reverse pitch with you sanjay and if you were to be in the entrepreneur seat for instance and there were three ideas that you were to pitch to the vcs right now what would those really be like keep it keep like two minutes for every pitch so i'm putting you on the hot spot right now no problem i think um, you know the first and foremost is that whatever i'm doing had better get a tailwind due to covid right as unfortunate as the circumstances are, the reality is about 30% of the businesses are getting a massive tailwind because of COVID, right? So uh, what I tell entrepreneurs is, you know, this is an, your opportunity, right? And, uh, you know, let's ignore the circumstances, right? We all agree that it's unfortunate uh, and it's the reality. But where does it create an opportunity, right? So... Uh, to what Vishal was saying as well, right? Even in retail, actually, he, he picked a very specific uh, space where there is actually huge opportunity, right? And and actually, we coincidentally uh, do work in that space through one of our companies. But there are a large number of retailers who have been, uh, you know, beholden to footfall in their stores, which is not going to happen, right? But need to go online do have the ability and the brand and the relationship with their customers to, to have them uh, shop from them online. So they don't have a distribution problem. They don't need to go to Amazon or a Flipkart to get their distribution necessarily right? because they do have the relationship with the customer, but they don't have the infrastructure and the ability to pull that off, right? Perhaps the last mile logistics delivery. So that will create one category of opportunities, right? Taking existing businesses that need to very quickly transition to go online, otherwise they're dead in the water. Right? So although you might say retail is, is a bad place to invest, there are certain sub-segments which are actually very attractive because it's survival for them. Right? The same thing we have seen, uh, we are in this company called MFine, which is in the telemedicine space. Right? Six months ago, there was talk of uh, people would say, well, is this thing legal in the first place? Right? Now the doctors are saying, please don't come to me. Please get on this app. Right? So the, it's a complete 180 degree you know, uh, different point of view. Right? Anything to do with remote. In fact, my uh, Twitter tagline says remote is now, right? Or the future is remote, right? Um, there's a small pun in it in case uh, if, you, if you got it, right? It's, it's, it's remote, but it's now, right? And, uh, uh, you know, so anything to do with digitization, right? Whether it is intercity trucking, whether it is, uh, uh, you know, the quote unquote, you know, the tagline that nobody liked, but the Uberization of whether it is any sort of field force management service, uh, I think you are going to see more and more. Uh, so, so that's the second segment, right? So the first one, I would say certain uh, categories which are going to help large businesses get digitized quickly and become, you know, online businesses because that is one. Uh, the second one, as I said, payments is going to become mainstream now. Digital payments is going to become mainstream. The money isn't in moving the bits, but there's a lot of services around it because it's becoming, you know, the largest part of somebody's, you know, revenue right for a large company so you cannot take any chances with that right um and then you know everything around education right that's the third sector uh, education is being changed completely it's becoming digital faster than you know uh, we are seeing uh, in one of our portfolio companies that's in the classroom training uh, space right i mean they they have like uh, you know 50 million active users around the world but suddenly india opened up as an opportunity right it was not something that they considered at all uh, they had a huge volume of users in the us uh, and we saw in the early days of covid you know indonesia malaysia you know southeast asia lighting up like you know, literally adding millions of users a day right uh, but now they're starting to see some of that pull coming in india as well right so i think there are huge sectors and huge industries that are going to be digitized and transformed industries that have been really really i would say lethargic about you know biting the bullet and doing it because they were doing fine uh, but now survival and compliance is another thing right there is no better value proposition to any company than saying your ceo will not go to jail 
right so once that's your value proposition actually you go to the top of the stack of any sales process right now for entrepreneurs it's important to make that transition right they cannot be sticking their head in the sand saying this is a 3 to 6 month issue it's going to come back it is not going to come back in certain areas right and it may have created an opportunity which is far more attractive than what you're working on right so don't be stuck in your ways because some new guy is going to come with no legacy and no uh, baggage and is going to straight go after the the new opportunity that's been created right so very important for entrepreneurs to use these you know 3 to 6 months uh, to not be um, i would say obstinate about what their business is right it's very hard to do i totally agree and we have companies in our portfolio and very high quality founders who you know keep saying well but this is going to come back isn't it right um, so i think very important for entrepreneurs they, you know there are companies with money in the bank with customers with revenue but there may be a much larger opportunity and often times it will be an adjacency it will be uh, so i always use this aspirin versus vitamin test i always tell people look in this mo- in this moment right all of us are only going to buy essential services right well just look ask yourself is an aspirin an essential service or is a vitamin an essential service right there is no way any of us would buy a vitamin right but an aspirin of course we will buy it right so just make sure that for the target segment you're going after and with the product and the value proposition this has to be an aspirin right because when you're solving a headache for someone no matter who you are they will want to buy your product and price is not going to be the reason why they will buy it it's because survival right so that's the key message to anyone you have to convert yourself to being an essential service and then there are lots of opportunities interesting i'll come to you now so will you will you fund me <laughs> <laughs> i'm i'm not quite Did sure Did i pass you're quite there i guess <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, Rohit, that that was that was uh, quite a mouthful from you, Sanjay. And thank you for laying it out for us. Like this, pretty interesting. Uh, Rohit, we heard from two VCs, and I think uh, both Vishal and Sanjay made their points very pertinently. Uh, Vishal really pointed out this entire growing case of you know duopolies, monopolies in the retail sector, and how to really survive. And while Sanjay said that you know convert yourself being an essential service, try and solving a headache for somebody essentially. So, Rohit, are you thinking that are you in the business where you are solving headaches for people, and how strongly can you convince Vishal and Sanjay on the other side, say that you are there for long and that you're resilient as an organization? Sure, and I think there are multiple underlying themes. You're talking about innovation, we're talking about uh, sustenance, and you're talking about growth, right? Yeah. So, so let's let's take an example from the past. Uh, what changed for let's say uh, Alibaba in 2002 was the SARS. Uh, Uh, epidemic, if I can call it, I, I really am not into segmenting and defining what a pandemic and epidemic is, but let's call it that for a moment, right? Uh, and we saw the birth of Taobao, Tmall, and even Jerry. dot com and stuff like that. It happened to that area, and uh, that's largely because people couldn't go out. The same kind of scenario that exists today: uh, essential services first and survival first. Uh, uh, so, so there is a definitive, uh, you know. thing that you've seen from the past which is laying out today uh, and it's going to lay out a little different for goods and services both in my mind uh, if you look at goods uh, even after the existence of amazon in the us for almost 25 years now uh, and i used to work with amazon for a while uh, before i joined pioneer uh, in fact i launched amazon in india before i joined pioneer so from that perspective i can tell you that even till the late 2016s and 17s the total uh, digital commerce market in the us which is a developed economy was sub 10% today uh, it has leapfrogged and it's estimated to be around 25 26% uh, some of the reasons are obviously that uh, you know the, the things like covid and pandemic uh, have caused uh, and we will see something similar happen to india at a much faster pace than what happened in the us china happened Uh, at a faster pace than the US, and we'll probably see India happening at a faster pace than even China. So we will leapfrog to thirty or forty or fifty percent, but doesn't mean that the physical retail will go away. What they need to do is rediscover themselves in form of what is appealing to customers. And Sanjay spoke uh, quite eloquently about it, so I'm not going to kind of repeat uh, what he said. But they need to find their sweet spots. They need to find out what are those additional services. And there are two things that come to my mind uh, when we talk about goods. 
one is what are the additional services the scope of services itself that they offer in addition to the product which is going to differentiate themselves and allow them to play the market in both a online and offline model and second is uh, sourcing itself right so so product quality uh, and uh, supply chain and those kind of things are really going to matter a lot as we develop so people have to work both in putting forward new technology to be able to serve their customers with newer features newer services at the same time work on their you know uh, back end side of their business where they can get faster supply chains much more augmented supply chains and at the same time uh, better product quality and product quality is relative to price so whatever uh, product quality they talk about the services business it's going to be very different uh think of you know uh, uh, think of uh, think of some you know simple thing that you know will i will i go back in a uber and sit as i would do it uh, say 3 months back no i don't think i will do that i'll be very worried and especially a large proportion of our population used to be uber, uber pool users not even uber users as they were right so so and they they need to come back and tell us how they going to uh, how the drivers would tell us that the car was cleaned 15 minutes before i sat in the car uh, a classic example is you know uh, when you go to a hotel the way the toilet paper is folded tells you that the room was cleaned before you entered the room right i mean those are simple granular innovations that that will work when you enter a aircraft today you get a pillow which is packed in that polythene and breaking that polythene gives you a satisfaction that it was cleaned so there are going to be these small granular changes and these are just final examples which i have seen in the past so they really don't will not necessarily stand the test for the future but i really don't see large big innovations alone coming i see a lot of small small granular innovations really coming through uh, which will tell us uh, that things are normal things can be used again in a different normal and people at some point of time will get back i mean i don't think the shared economy or uh, things like travel will will be put off forever Whether they'll take two years, one year, uh, probably I'm not a visionary to kind of comment on that, but definitely not for the next ten, twelve months. Uh, to be to be honest, there is a sinister happiness that I'm not traveling. I'm spending more time at home with my family, so so I'm not looking forward to more travel for sure, right? So so those are some of the things that that will work as far as innovation is concerned uh, across the board. In at Pioneer, we really believe that we have two or three opportunities. One is. uh you know the ecosystem play which again uh, vishal and aditya both spoke of uh so we don't believe that we are just a payments company we build we believe in building the ecosystem so today when you come to pioneer you not only get to open new markets with us so if you are a seller who is selling on amazon in the us you can expand to a marketplace like seed discount which is a leading french marketplace and we help you really go there so it's not only payments but we do like a bunch of activities which is forward and backward so we'll help you with logistics if you are a service provider then we would do time tracking for you as a software or invoicing as a software or you know we'll have apis with partners like uh, quickbooks and uh, xero where you know you will be able to do your accounting in a much more integrated and seamless way so there are a bunch of such uh, things that we do and uh, again the same concept holds true we don't look at one big innovation necessarily we look at small small innovations which are you know improving customer experience as we go along uh, in india specifically we believe that uh, innovations around the regulations will really be very opportune at this point of time uh, simple example i my mom went through a hip replacement just before the covid and i wanted to apply for a insurance claim it's stuck because i can't send a physical document to the insurance company this will change uh, this will get disrupted for sure because uh all these paperwork will become digital completely and the innovators will really find a very very clean market there so so these are some examples that come to my mind uh and pioneer really believes that uh, the ecosystem and continuous development of some of these things is is the way yeah so we understood that i think uh, in the interest of sort of time i think uh, i wanted to sort of get to another round of questioning but uh, Uh, we we'll sort of get into the concluding round of questioning and be specific to the payment space because we spoke about innovation, customer experience. Uh, we had two VCs really talk about the opportunity in the challenges landscape. We also saw Sanjay getting into the other side and doing a reverse pitch. Uh, we saw Vishal talking sort of very upright about whether what he sees makes sense or not makes sense. Aditya trying to tell us that what innovation he has been doing, and of course uh, Rohit telling us that uh, you know. 
he's very positive and bullish the way he goes from here. Uh, two specific trends from each of you and very specific to the payment space and in India, what could those be? The two defining trends for digital payments in India, the future of digital payments and where do we go from here? Aditya, I'll start with you. Ah, just a couple of lines, right? So before I go to the trends, the way we view the uh, payments is, it's an infinite game, right? So it is not like a cricket where set of players playing set of rules and you declare, oh, this guy won. No, it is ongoing and it will continue to go. There are no definite rules and the result is undeclared, right? So we can keep winning this game and keep fighting it. So in our view, the two key trends will be one, as we discussed, a holistic platform where we are not talking about doing part of the business, right? We are talking about entire financial supply chain. For example, which uh, Rohit just mentioned, right? The claim settlement is pending. So we want to not only talk about the collection part of it, settlement, everything should go digital. So we are talking about uh, uh, all the four pillars, right? The savings, lending, investment, and insurance, everything will be API driven. So that's our view. It will be more of a platform play in future. The second trend will be the scalability, right? So we are happy to talk a lot about online payments, but do we have that kind of infrastructure? Even a fintech company like us may have, does a bank have that kind of structure in their legacy system? So maybe there is a play for a fintech companies to work as a TSP for a bank and help them to build their infrastructure as well. So I see that these are the two trends, uh, a platform and more on the infrastructure side. The rest will be user behavior, which will keep changing and the business model will keep evolving when Sanjay and Vishal keep funding the new business model. That will keep going. <laughs> so Vishal, Aditya has passed the ball on to you now, clearly. Yeah, no, I think um, one area that I definitely am very excited about is the whole payment software ecosystem. I think not only B2C, but I think the massive tailwinds I see are on more on the B2B side because they've been the most resistant so far. But I'm pretty sure what Aditya and Rohit are seeing a ton of videos that they're doing product demos from small to medium businesses and even large businesses who want to digitize their across the financial part of their platform, whether it's payouts to insurance agents, whether it's um, acceptance at point, whether it's uh, in, in retail, in, in financial services, across the ecosystem, I see the digitization wave, which we are very, we are very consumer focused because we, we sort of, as individuals, we tend to sort of operate and, and look at that because that's what comes up to us very quickly as personal experiences. But I think there's a very large market on the B2B ecosystem side. And I think that's going to be very large. Uh, with lots of tailwinds behind that business and all the business are looking to digitize those opportunities. That's one. The second one I would say is, I think this essentially brings, uh, let, let me be contrarian on this one, the death knell of lending fintech. Uh, I think uh, Island FS was the first blow. I think this essentially is, is the nail in the coffin, uh, which essentially says that I can build a lending business without operating as an NBFC and I want 10 times revenue multiple when basically you're a price to book business at the end of the day. It is the best, the best lender in this country before COVID was at four times price to book is now, is now operates at three times price to book and 2.2 times price to book. So growing has grown 25% year on year for last hundred quarters. So who are you to have a price to revenue multiple? Um, if you're lending on your balance. Interesting. Uh, Sanjay, I'll come to you now. You mentioned, the Vishal mentioned the death knell of the fintech lending space and huge pockets of opportunity in the software scale space, the B2B space. Uh, what is your sense to a mega trend, the digital payment space defining the future of the payments industry in India? So, uh, first of all, on that one particular point, I think we have spoken with uh, uh, our checkbook. You know, we have never backed companies that are lending uh, that are nbfcs you know i mean some of them have eventually got licenses but our view has always been the role of fintech is to enable new, new distribution models new you know use cases perhaps you know where new underwriting models can can help but 
being a you know raising equity uh, capital to create a book was sort of uh, not something that we understood and we stay, uh, we have never backed but we've got companies like moneytap credex uh, neo etc which are all doing uh, or facilitating a lot of lending right and i think that's where the opportunity for fintechs are um, my big prediction is actually we are going to see the incumbent banks get much more aggressive on digitization right and i think uh that's going to happen so the fintechs which kind of had a bit of a free run uh, in this space now are going to see the incumbents uh, come back and they need to make sure that they are playing the right roles there right so as i think aditya mentioned you know fintechs can enable the incumbents as well uh and we need to really understand where are our unique uh, value propositions right it could be in distribution it could be in uh, Uh, very pointed solutions the good news is the market is huge and it's going to become even deeper right so earlier a company had to do five six different things and each of which was like a 5 million dollar a year you know business unit in order to cobble its way to 20 25 million dollars of revenue now you can actually do one thing and then you will be forced to do one thing and do it so well right that in that one particular area for that segment of customers there is no question that you are the only one that uh, that people should be going to right and we are going to get into much many more and this is what you see in the us right startups in the us don't build platforms and do 20 things there are a handful of them that turn into platforms later on but otherwise if you see startups do one thing they do it incredibly well laser focused right and they don't do other things that's why when we look at some of the y combinator startups for example when they come out they look like features right and how can somebody you know, actually fund this company 57 million dollars when it comes out of yc right but that's because there is depth in the market and people know i can build a large company just doing this one thing india is in transition phase and moving into that kind of a uh, situation which is great for entrepreneurs they don't have to do 15 things but you got to do one thing very well that's easier said than done though that right? we like to build you know amazing products with everybody wants to pitch a platform nobody wants to pitch a service or a solution to one particular segment right and that's because historically in india you take any enterprise software company um, market size is 10 million dollars right that has changed now the second big trend that i'm really excited about is that for every especially since the world is moving to software solutions is that the world is our opportunity right because the customer everywhere in the world including in the smallest districts of india to uh, to new york has been trained to buy products and services from somebody who's at the other side of a zoom call no longer are they expecting you to come face to face it will be a huge opportunity for indian companies right because now there is no differentiation between somebody who's sitting on one side of university avenue in palo alto or in hsr layout or in koramangala right if the customer is in new york or even on the opposite side of the street in palo alto the customer will say let's just do this meeting on zoom right or on uh, google hangouts or whatever so indian companies have to realize that opportunity right it will also mean that anybody can come and target indian customers they don't have a free run here in india right so uh, you have to just basically become the specialist become the best at what you do and the world is your opportunity so again super exciting times but definitely what worked in the past is not necessarily what's going to work in the future and entrepreneurs who realize that will have you know potential to build some great companies here okay uh, rohit i want to sort of come to you we heard from sanjay he's he very excited about the opportunity he said the past necessarily can't decide the future and rightly so but because i think vishal was also saying that the pandemic disrupted the illusionary certainty of a hindsight and very clearly we don't really have that certainty of hindsight anymore the pandemic seems to have disrupted that always from a practitioner's perspective from payoni two specific trends in the payments industry where we go from here in india what would those be a uh, sweet and sharp yeah yeah so i think uh, sanjay and vishal both touched upon it uh, and i am a complete believer in what sanjay said uh, in in global opportunity being present and we already see that right so people are building saas products which are anyways usable globally and we have success stories already like zohos of the world and fresh desk of the world uh, in india who kind of you know created products which were which are being used globally so same for payments uh we we are at a cusp where we are building solutions which are really high tech uh upi is a classic example where uh, we anticipate that it will be exported uh, probably in a different form and shape but uh, but nobody is as advanced in payer ids as we are in upi so i really believe very strongly that uh, payment is going to get exported from india 
uh, to the world and that's one big trend in my mind in the next uh, you know 12 to 36 months that's going to zoom past us and we have that opportunity the second is what vishal spoke about which is b2b because that's not been uh, liberated as yet as much as b2c and uh, i see businesses are compelled to adopt uh, this today uh, sometimes unwillingly, but uh, most of these people are hungry for business. They are super passionate. When you come to the SMBs, that's that's why they survive. That's why they really do well. And uh, I see them adopting uh, newer ways, more efficient ways, and they will teach us a lot uh, in the bargain. So we have to keep our eyes open in uh, you know uh, values that they offer, or value drivers that they bring to the table through payments and just uh, you know uh, leap on top of it so so for example uh, today you know uh, swiggies of the world can offer lending because they are very large companies they are the software stack they have the uh, ability to do machine, le machine learning to be able to predict who will pay who will not pay but probably a restaurant down the road, road does not do that uh, I see that changing and a restaurant is probably a very euphem is a euphemism for what could happen immediately versus long term. But uh, I believe that SMBs uh, need to be liberated and if there are disruptions and we will see disruptions where people will be able to do uh, some of these things. So lending no more will be a NBFC as a game. It will become NBFC will become something like SaaS. It will become NBFC as a service kind of a model where uh, many SMBs would be able to jump onto it. So that's, that's those are two trends in my mind which uh, which will take place again. Uh, keep, keep our fingers crossed and see some of these things happen uh, for us. Okay, I think uh, Aditya, uh, I would also just want to understand from you. We're talking about experiences. Uh, one key learning that you have had you know, in this entire process, what would that be? Uh, which would learn the hard way? Uh, that would be which Vishal mentioned, right? The cash is king, so don't dry up. So keep always, uh, don't play by the commercial game at all. Uh, the, your value should speak, right? So that's the uh, one learning we, are, we have learned in the past. The kind of background I have come from, the kind of company I'm working, that is all in line with that. And we will continue to go in that. We won't undercut on pricing. We don't start the price war. Rather, I deliver the value. And one of the points with Vishal and Rohit said, B2B, yeah, it's a big segment, right? So these are the things I noted down, which may be my business development plan immediately after this meeting. So uh, learning is no price game. Let's focus on the value creation. That's it. Uh, Vishal, uh Give me a sense of, you know, you're tapping the global VC network. Uh, what some sense or color of the conversation going around there about the fintech or the payments opportunity, uh, particularly in India. You know, fintech is a very, very broad term. How equally excited, disappointed they are, uh, you know, and I think the VC and straight been criticized that they seem to be having a herd mentality. E-commerce was hot once. Uh, fintech was hot another time. Now there seems to be this huge influx of the B2B or the authorization, so to speak. Uh, give me some color or sense there. You know, the real picture of how fintech is a... Is fintech becoming a bad word, purely for entrepreneurs? I think as, as investors and entrepreneurs, I don't think we should chase fads. Fads come and go. Valuable businesses are built over periods of time. There's always a tailwind that appears for each business at some point of time over their journey of 8 to 15 years when a valuable business gets built and you have to cash in on that opportunity. So I don't think e-commerce is a bad word. I, 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 I think uh, you, you saw that in 2004, you know, craziness in 2013, 14, a dip in investment in 2015, 16, and now, and you then you saw again craziness. So you shouldn't worry about these market cycles, you know, public markets, you can see 50% swings, businesses haven't changed much, sentiments change and dollars in and out change. But if you are an entrepreneur, you're building a business heads down, if you're executing really well and delivering value to your customers, whether it's a individual uh, consumer or it's a B2B, that's what really matters. I think globally, fintech is a has created a ton of value for everybody. So if you look at Shopify, one of our portfolio companies early on, and, and we knew the fact that it went public and we liquidated our position after it went public at 10 billion plus, it's now an $85 billion market cap company, $85 billion. Out of that, 
what people don't realize is out of that 60% actually comes from the payments ecosystem. It does not come from their core ecosystem of, um, you know, allowing people to set up shops virtually very quickly and start selling. So a large percentage of it comes from payments. If you look at a whole host of companies in that ecosystem, actually a lot of value is, is the core platform, but the fintech layer on top of the platform. Uh, it may be around payments, it may be around as an arbitrator on lending, point of making on lending, variety of different things in which you can cut that data. There's a lot of value there. I think India, though slightly, in my view, is slightly different and unique. The economics for a simple pass player in a US ecosystem is 3%. That does not exist in India. And it's not going to exist. Here, you have to fight harder, in my view, to build value because a lot of that economics essentially ride in, uh, have been taken away by this, which is fantastic, I would say, at some level, by this public utility called UPI and NPCI. And there will be more stuff that happens there. So you have to fight differently and much harder to build that sort of value. It's much harder to build that value in FinTech in India. But if you do, I think if, if you look at, if you can do that, it's a very large market and you get value disproportionately, I think, in India versus anywhere else. So there's nowhere else that banks and NBFCs, which are very successful, there's a Bajaj Finance, which can trade at seven times price to book. I don't think there's any any lending platform globally which trades at that sort of a multiple. Neither does a Kotak or a HTFC which trade at four to five times. So I think you get disproportionately valued in India if you're able to execute really well and monetize and, and build a business. The harder part is it's execution is tougher and the opportunity on monetization are, are slivers which are not so easy to execute in India vis-a-vis -vis in the US where there's a lot more meat in the market. Uh, not only US, most, most of the European ecosystem and, and other ecosystems. Interesting. Uh, I think uh, Sanjay, I'll come to you and then I will sort of uh, get on to the rapid fire because I think all of you are sort of sitting, uh, seeing at your watches and it's already time. Uh, Sanjay, my, my question to you really is about uh, this entire opportunity set on the Bharat versus uh, India question that often comes up. Uh, you know, how does that pose uh, for the payments ecosystem, so to speak? You know, are the difference of opportunities uh, for the metros or for the villages and you think that have been tapped? Are you seeing some interesting ideas coming from the startups that you're speaking with? Uh, because you have seen some on the e-commerce side, but are there some very revolutionary ideas tapping a very, very large untapped market when we speak there? Interesting uh, question, actually. I was just reflecting today, you know, we talk about a lot of the migrant uh, uh, workforce heading back home and probably in many cases not wanting to come back into the urban settings. And what is the ramification of that, right? The so one positive ramification of that pro is that these are people who actually have been technically savvy, who have been using smartphones and apps and digital payments and stuff. And they're all now going back to the hinterlands and they're carrying that knowledge with them, right? So one positive that's going to happen is they're all going to go back and say, hey, you know, we should be using all these amazing UPI apps and we can do, you know, real-time payments and interbank payments, et cetera, right? So they're going to be sharing it with their, uh, um, with their family and they're going to be helping training them, etc. So in a strange way, this situation might cause a lot more digitization to happen uh, in areas where we thought it was going to be much later, right? And so this India-Bharat divide that we like to, you know, fashionably uh, raise, right? And there is no need to necessarily build specifically for Bharat because a lot of the products and services that we build. I, I, my, my view is actually... Uh, it's a failure on the part of the entrepreneurs if you have to build a separate product for Bharat, right? It just means that we didn't, didn't, didn't do it right, right? And that's why we are thinking, I mean, yes, you can have a different user experience with voices and input and things like that, but entrepreneurs really should be striving, and I'm pointing at myself as well, uh, you know, we should be striving to make everything so easy to use that anybody can use it, right? And um, frankly, I think, everybody's needs are the same, right? We, you know, learning to deal with our money, learning to uh, manage our money, learning to invest it. Yes, the scale, you know, and, and there is also this sort of implicit uh, connotation that, you know, people in the, in the rural parts of India or in Bharat have less money, right? It's not necessarily true, right? In fact, 
right from my M Tech days in 2007, 2008, we ran a survey with uh, people saying, how much would you pay for your electricity bill to be paid through your mobile, right? And most people in the SECA said zero because I have seven other options, including sending my driver and to stand in line. But as you went down, people said, okay, you know, of course I'll pay, you know, 10 rupees, 15 rupees, because that's what my bus fare is going to be. And it's half day of income loss, right? So we have to explain the, articulate the value and build the value proposition, right? Uh, sure, there will be some use case differences, right? So there might be a need for, you know, perhaps more lending towards agri products in those cases versus uh, versus a television or something like that in the, in the metros. Uh, but broadly, I think, um, you know, the fact that everybody has come into, with, you know, Jandan Aadhaar and uh, mobile, you know, they're in the digital ecosystem. People around them have now learned about this thing and are able to share it with them. We will see again uh, an explosion of services. Uh, I think the opportunity is large enough that somebody can say this is all I'm going to do. Uh, but no doubt in my mind that there will be some amazing entrepreneurs coming out with, with solutions for, for all those segments. Once again, you know, India is going to go from one large company that tried to serve the entire 1.4 billion people to a number of companies that are going after 30 million user type of segments, which is, you know, a decent country in Europe, right? So. There will be opportunities, you know, if you can go after that segment and if you can get, let's say, 50 to 100 rupees per user net uh, out of that, you know, and if you have 10% market share, now you're talking a business that's doing, you know, 300, 400 crores a year of revenue, right? That's a great place to be. Interesting. I will perhaps uh, do a reverse order this time and start my rapid fire with Rohit. Because Rohit has been very intently listening to everybody. So Rohit, my first question to you, if you were to name one fintech company which you admire the most besides yours, what would that be? Uh, actually, many. Uh, so give me one. Give me uh, one. My, my bet is on Stripe. I think I love that company. Uh, the kind of innovation. Stripe. Stripe, yeah. Uh, they've done a bunch of innovations and really impressed with them over a period of time and what they have done. Okay, Vishal, my question to you, is UPI a friend or an enemy? Depends on who you are. <laughs> for you, what it is for your portfolio company? Suppose you are a backer of cash free. How would you look at a UPI? I think that's a question best asked to Aditya. I think as a consumer, <laughs> I would say it's a great friend, great technology, very scalable. I think there are some, of course, there are niggling issues still on the scalability, but I think that's that's a function of most, I think, I, I don't think anybody anticipated the scale that they would get to at, at such a rapid pace. But I would say from a consumer perspective, it definitely is a friend. I would actually say for a lot of companies, it's taken away a revenue pool, which was significant. Okay. Aditya, I have the question for you. UPI, a friend or an enemy? Yeah, that's a tricky one. Uh, it hurts and it helps simultaneously. So I think I will still take a middle ground frenemy because still things right now it is hurting, but I'm sure long run this will help. So I'll keep it that way. And one fintech company which you admire the most and besides yours? <laughs> Very difficult. Uh, but I think I'll go ahead with PayPal right now. Uh, we are kind of associated. They It is enabled as a payment mode on our platform. So I think we Okay, Sanjay, my last question to you. If you were stuck in an elevator with Sachin Bansal, what will be your advice to him on fintech? I would not advise Sachin Bansal. <laughs> he has built you know, a multi-billion dollar company, you know, so I would be asking him for advice. <laughs> Vishal, what would you tell Sachin? But, but, but to answer your earlier question, UPI is absolutely a friend and you better figure out how to make it your friend. Right? It's here to stay and that's the reality of it. Right? So there's no point in thinking about that. And the one company I would I'll vote for a company in my portfolio is a company called Credex. It's just an incredibly beautiful business model. People have tried several times to copy it, but six years later, there's nobody on the horizon. And the entrepreneur is really someone who taught me something very special, which is uh, somebody came and asked him, what would you do if I gave you an extra $25 million? What would you do differently if I gave you an extra $25 million of investment? And he instantly replied, nothing. Right? Because this is what we want in entrepreneurs. You should have conviction about how you're building a business and build it. Right? Money is never a reason why good companies, good companies don't die of starvation, but they could, could die of indigestion. Right? So be very focused on how you're building your business. 
Okay, I think we had a very meaningful panel here. At least I took down lots of notes and a lot of points here, starting from Aditya to Vishal to Rohit to Sanjay. And thank you so much for being so candid and so meaningful in all your responses. Till the time we see you next, goodbye and good luck. And I do hope you and yours are staying safe. And thank you so much for joining us for this series on the Live Mint Future of Payments. Thank you once again. Thank you.